the Baptist Broadcast. Thank you guys for tuning in. From Spotify, iTunes, I think the Podcast Addict. I've never heard of that before, but but I recently seen in the in the um, analytics uh, and the the stats on Anchor.fm that apparently it's it's piped out to Podcast Addict as well. So you can you can access this podcast through there. If you're watching on YouTube, do not forget to subscribe to the channel. You see the that red button there reminding you to do so and click that bell for continue notifications that's always helpful in staying up to date on on things that you know we're doing here so i wanted to do a little bit of work in john 17 5 today now let me just begin with a preface when we're talking about theology proper when we're talking about the doctrine of god and when we're talking about trinitarianism these are doctrines that are formulated as the result of a expansive consideration of the holy scripture and so you're you're not going to be able to determine what your theology proper is on the basis or or determine what your theology proper is not on the basis of what you conclude about a single verse in Scripture. And what's more, when you're dealing with texts in Scripture that are, um, and, 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 and all texts in Scripture are like this to some extent, because the context of every, of every text is Scripture, is the whole of Scripture itself. I mean, if you're talking about broad context, then the context of every verse is Scripture. And so when you're looking at passages, especially passages like this, that come to us within the context of the incarnation of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God speaking according to his human nature, and you, you come to a text like this that comes after several ontological statements in Scripture that tell us very clearly who God is or what God is not. Thinking of texts like Deuteronomy 6.4, Exodus 3.14, Malachi 3.6. And so you've, you've, got a, you've got more of a context to work with than just John 17.5. And that broader context is, is going to determine in part how you take John 17.5. So the meaning of John 17, 5, is not necessarily derivative from John 17, 5 itself. No matter how much exegesis you do on the thing, no matter how, how you slice and dice it, um, it, it comes to us within a context, and that context is Scripture. And John 17, 5 isn't producing a logical contradiction with texts such as Malachi 3.6 or texts such as uh, Exodus 3.14. There's nothing in John 17 or in John 17.5 that is going to uh, deny the unchangeableness and, immuta and, and immutability of God that we see in places like Malachi 3.6. There's, there's nothing in John 17 or John 17, 5, more specifically, that is going to deny the subject matter of uh, Exodus 3, 14, uh, the self-existence or aseity of God, or Deuteronomy 6, 4, the unity of the, of the Godhead, uh, the oneness, uh, the numerical unity or the oneness of the divine essence. So there's, there's nothing in the New Testament, there's nothing in the Old or New Testaments that is going to contradict the ontological reality or the ontological statements about God, what God is, elsewhere in Scripture. It's just not going to happen. And, and because that's the case, because we assume that the Scriptures are perfectly consistent throughout, then we're not going to be able to interpret John 17, 5 in such a way that's going to necessarily imply some kind of contradiction with other texts in Scripture like the ones that I've just mentioned, Malachi 3, Deuteronomy 6, and Exodus 3. Um, but having said that, I think it is important to consider John 17, 5, and to consider um, how it fits in with the rest of Scripture, and, and I think that's a very valuable thing to do. 
Now, what I will say is that a, a, an hermeneutical assumption that was being carried through um, uh, the exegesis of the earlier church, and you find this even in John Calvin, you find it in um, John Gill, you find it in um, in the Puritans, generally speaking, uh, is what's called partitive exegesis. And partitive exegesis is exegesis done with the creator-creature distinction in mind, such that our exegetical conclusions are not going to imply a mixture, confusion, uh, or a blurring of the lines between that creator-creature um, uh, divide, chasm, whatever you want to call it. The creator is not the creature. The creature is not the creator. Um, another way we could put this is the fathers and the and the uh, post Reformation um, Puritans, for example, were always reading Scripture in such a way that would not result, in terms of their exegetical conclusions, would not result in the conflation of what would be considered theologia or and and oikonomia. So we don't want to mix those things together. Theology, which most technically taken means God in himself, oikonomia or economy, all things in relation to God, God's works. And so partitive exegesis says that you need to be reading the text in such a way that those two things are never going to be blended together. The works of God, the effects of God, the creature is never going to be uh you know, made to be God or, or said to be God, and God likewise is not going to be dragged down into creatureliness through our, through our biblical exegesis. And that partitive exegesis is made necessary by the reality of the perfect consistency of God's holy word uh, and, and taking into consideration texts that, that provide very strong ontological substantive statements about who God is in himself. All right, uh, self-existence, immutability. And, and so interpreting Scripture in such a way, especially texts that relate to the incarnation of Christ and the assumption of a human nature, interpreting texts in such a way, especially texts like those that do not conflate the creator-creature distinction or that dis distinction between theologia or oikonomia theology, economy. If you want a really good book on that, I would recommend uh, Dr. Richard Barcello's uh, Trinity and Creation. I think that's very helpful in bringing out that distinction. Um, it, it, um, it, it, it has been helpful for me. So with that said, let's go ahead and get started. Now, one of the things that I had to do here, because Logos does not allow you to write on it, I had to take a screenshot of Logos. Um, so I'm not going to be able to um, play around with Oops, wrong screen. I'm not going to be able to play around with the text in in you know in the way that I might like to be able to play around with it. I'm not sure why that's coming up on the screen there, but um, it'll go away here in a moment, I, I think. So, um, so what I had to do is I had to take a screenshot of the relevant areas that I wanted to talk about and and put them into a, an app on my iPad called GoodNote, and so that's what you see before you hear. And so let's go ahead and just jump into it. Uh, again, uh, what I don't want to do is I don't want to imply the negation of texts like Malachi 3.6 or Exodus 3.14. We want to leave intact that theology proper. And we don't want to imply any sort of contradiction uh, that would run against the grain of the theology proper, the tone and tenor, the remainder of the scriptures. Um, and so that is how we interpret, you know, smaller sections of text, maybe more obscure sections of text, in light of very clear ontological statements that have been made about God. And, um, and here John 17, 5 is, is no uh, exception. But before we get to uh, look at a couple of things, uh, make a couple of observations about the text that I would like to make, um, I would like to interact uh, briefly with some uh, two commentators on John 17, 5, just so that I can show you how uh, John 17, 5 was being read partitively um, before, you know, the Enlightenment really got a hold of us. Um, 
and um, and so uh, so these commentators number one would be Matthew Poole looking at Matthew Poole and I'm also going to look at John Gill I also read an article on John Calvin regarding John 17 5 that's on the Baptist broadcast.org so uh, or maybe it's dot com now I can't remember uh, let's see yeah, it's .com. So the thebaptistbroadcast.com. That's the first article you're going to see because it's one of the most recent ones. So John Calvin on John 17, 5, where you can see, you know, Calvin stands alone in a lot of his biblical interpretation uh, in certain areas. He's, you know, definitely not um, uh, a trained theologian. He's a trained lawyer. Um, and uh, But given, you know, all things considered, he's, he's, he's decent. Uh, but in, in his exegesis, sometimes he's standing alone in, in some, some areas and has some novel interpretations. But concerning John 17, 5, um, I think he's, he's being quite consistent with the part of exegesis. Um, I also have an article there that's just right behind that one, John Gill's Christology. So those two would be, uh, would be relevant uh, areas. But here I'm gonna look, we're going to look at Matthew Poole on John 17, 5, and then John Gill on John 17, 5. So first, what does Matthew Poole say about John 17, 5? Um, he says this. He says, Let the glory which, as to my divine nature, he's expounding upon, or he's, 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 he's you know, kind of, saying this is what Christ was saying. This is the meaning or the sense of his words. Let the glory which, as to my divine nature, I had with thee before the foundation of the world be communicated also to my human nature, that my whole person may be made glorious. From hence is easily concluded against those who deny the Godhead of Christ that Christ was glorified with his Father before the world was, which he could not have been if he had not been eternal God. He here begs of his Father that that glory might shine upon his person as mediator. In other words, this is Jesus Christ, the eternal Son of God, according to his human nature, praying for glory, that the glory which he's always had according to his divine nature would be shown through in his human nature as well as mediator, he says. John Gill on John 17, 5 says, Not with his perfections, these he had, they dwelt bodily in him, or with his nature in which he was, not, in which he was one with him, that is one with God, but as mediator, with his glorious presence in heaven, by setting him at his right hand and crowning him with glory and honor. This again, very incarnational saying that Jesus Christ, according to his human nature, is praying for this glory, that this glory of God would be shown through in the person of the Son, according not only to the divine nature, but also according to the human nature as well. Uh, according to the divine nature, he has always had this glory. He did not forfeit it, lay it aside. Um, he did not um, suspend it. Uh, this glory he always had. Even in his incarnate state, as God, he always had this glory. But now he's praying that, according to his human nature, he would be glorified. Um, and then Gil says, uh, the Jews have a notion that God will give to the King Messiah this glory. And then he goes on later on in, in this commentary, he says, Nor did it exist from eternity. It was indeed, and he's talking about this incarnate glory that the Son prays for. Nor did it exist from eternity. It was indeed written in God's book of predestination. Even all its members, when as yet there were none of them in actual being, it was set up in God's thoughts and counsel as the pattern and exemplar of human nature. And so John Gill here appealing to predestination as another factor that should be taken into consideration when thinking about how to take the sense of John 17, 5. So anyway, here we have John 17, 5 before us. We've seen an example of how that's been read partitively by other exegetes, and now we come to it ourselves. Now, if you look at verse 5, it says, And now, O Father, glorify me together with yourself with the glory which I had with you before the world was. Now, if you notice here at the beginning, and now, O Father, glorify me. Oops, I'm using the wrong tool. It says here, glorify me. Now, this term is in the imperative. 
it, the, the term's going to show up again, it, it, which is how it shows up again is going to help us, uh, and that's what you see on the right side of your screen, it's going to help us understand what's, what's being said here in John 17, 5. Um, and then in terms of understanding what this glory is, you know, if we're taking the passage partitively, that is, if we're, if we're, if we're understanding that creaturely language, creaturely attributes, creaturely process, mutability, um, composition, uh, so on and so forth, must be ascribed to the creaturely nat nature of the Son then I think we have to come away, at, you know, with a conclusion regarding John 17, 5, that this is the Son praying according to his human nature, that this glory that he has had with God the Father before the foundation of the world would be, um, uh, would be manifest in him according to his human nature upon his ascension. Now, the other thing I want to bring out, when you look at this phraseology toward the end, the glory which I had with you before the world was. Um, the fact that this glory existed before the world was. Now, we can talk about what the world comprises, but I think if, if you're just going with a, a reading of like Genesis 1.1, the world is time, space, and matter. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And... Um, if time is a feature of creation um, and not a feature of the eternal divinity or the divine essence, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, um, then what you have here in John 17, 5 is the necessity that Christ never laid aside this glory. Because that which is possessed before the foundation of the world, that which is possessed prior to features of creation, right, cannot undergo or, or cannot be implied in being subject to those same features of creation. In other words, if something is before the foundation of the world, it's eternal, um, it's infinite, it's not, unbound, it's not bounded by, by creaturely categories, um, it just is God, right? And if that's the case, then this is something that cannot be gained or lost, it cannot undergo process of change. It cannot be forfeited. It cannot be um, suspended. It cannot be laid aside because it can't undergo any sort of process of change. Uh, it cannot undergo or be subject to any kind of features that are proper to the creation because this is something that is status quo before the foundation of the world, before the world was. And the world coming into existence does not affect this glory. It has no implication upon this glory whatsoever. God is not acted upon, though God acts upon his creatures. All right, so if we understand that this glory is 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 that which Christ prays for according to his human nature, in his human nature, that something of the divine glory would be shown forth in his person according to the human nature. All right, we're reading the text partitively. And then if furthermore, if we understand that this glory was something that the Son possessed with the Father prior to the foundation of the world, prior to the world coming into existence out of nothing, then this is a glory that cannot undergo any sort of change and cannot be subject to any sort of feature of creation, right? Because it transcends all of that. And if it transcends all of that, then it cannot be subject unto it, which is why the incarnation is so important. The assumption of a human nature is essential if the Son is going to work the work of redemption. If that makes sense. If the Son is going to uh, undergo penal substitutionary atonement, right? He cannot do so according to the divine nature, hence the necessary need of assuming the fullness of a human nature in order to do that, in order to, in order to redeem man in that way. John 17, verses 20 through 26, you know, just kind of taking in the, f you know, more full context here, I think helps us to better understand um, John 17, 5, if you look at verse 24 specifically, Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which you have given me, for you loved me before the foundation of the world. 
All right. Again, there's another uh, another um, the phrase here before the foundation of the world, which is very similar to you know this this phrase over here, though it's not you know identical. It's it's communicating the same thing in substance. Before the world was, before the foundation of the world, um, you know, we wouldn't say that. Um, uh, when Jesus says in verse 24, you loved me before the foundation of the world, we wouldn't say that there's any change in the love of God, would we? Um, in light of the incarnation, uh, you know, that's, that's something that, that remains the same. It remains static. It's, it's, it's not subject to features of creation, we might say. Um, and, uh, and then also, when, when Christ talks about, in verse 24, behold my glory which you, Father, have given me, right? And that given me is in the aorist. Um, so, behold my glory, which you have given me. Now, he, here it becomes, I think, particularly clear that the Lord is speaking according to his human nature, right? This is the high priestly prayer. He, in view here is the reward for his finished work, namely the glorification of his person according to the human nature. And then also notice in verse 24 that they may behold, that they may behold, that's very important language. And actually I'm going to go um, here. Um, that they may behold and so you, you ask yourself, you know, what is, what is that? In the NAS, it says, Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, be with me where I am so that they may see. And it's, um, it's uh, feoreo there, that they may observe, that they may see. Well, you know, in, in, in glory, we're, we're still going to be creatures, right? We're still going to be creatures. We're not going to have, you know, the infinite essence of God directly communicated to our person such that we become infinite as well. Um, that's just, that, that would be an absurd notion. The finite cannot comprehend the infinite. The infinite cannot, um, uh, you know, cannot be uh, communicated to that which is finite by nature. Um, and so when, when you, you read statements like what we find in verse 24, uh, that they may behold, that they may observe, that they may see my glory, which you have given me. This must be glory that is made manifest according to a nature that we can observe, that we can see, which would be the human nature of the divine person of the Son, which he assumed at the fullness of time. Okay, and so I think if we keep reading from John 17:5 on to John 17, 24, what we see is that this is, a, this is a glory that Christ prays for, that is a glory according to his human nature, that the, that the glory he has always had before the world was. It's interesting that John 17, 5 doesn't say, um, before I took on flesh, you know, Jesus doesn't say, glorify me with the glory that I had with you before I assumed the fullness of a human nature, right? No, he says, before the world was, all right. This is a glory transcendent of the change of creation, of the features of creation, of the coming into being of creation. This is what the Son possesses um, or is identified with along with the Father in eternity past in virtue of the fact that they are identified with the same numerically one divine essence, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Um, but then you come, to, you come to John 17, 24, and you find out, that this is a glory which the Father gives to the Son as a result of his finished work, um, and it's a glory that's going to be beheld by creatures. This is a glory that's going to be observed by creatures. And so you, you, you're automatically left with a glory that is shown through, that is given to the person of the Son according to a human nature. That is a nature that allows the person of the Son to be perceived by those who are finite, namely us, creatures. This is the human nature which the divine person of the Son assumed to himself in the fullness of time, and this is the nature through which we see the fullness of God and the glory of God. This is how we're able to observe 
the glory of God, is that it's going to be shown through in the human nature of the Son. Okay, so it's a glorious passage, and, and it's, it's, it's an important one. I think it's an important that we, that we get it right. I think it's important that we read it partitively. Um, I don't, I don't, you know, I don't think we should try to come to texts like this um, as a tabula rasa, uh, or, or I don't think we should come to texts like this trying to dump all of our presuppositions. I think we ought to have the right presuppositions when we come to texts like John seventeen five, um, you know, sup, those those presuppositions being something like you know God is unchanging, He's immutable, God is infinite, He cannot be communicated to to creatures or or change or undergo any sort of quantification like creatures can and do and must. And so this is, you know, when when we're considering who God is, um, we know that God is. In himself, that God is immutable, simple, so on and so forth, then we can't interpret texts like John 17, 5 in such a way that's going to compromise on our theology proper. Instead, we take our theology proper with us when we read texts like John 17. Anyways, hopefully this was helpful. Uh, it's definitely not exhaustive. It's definitely not, um, you know, perhaps a nail in the coffin for you if you're kind of um, on the fence about all of this, the conversation on theology proper, classical Christian theism, and so on and so forth. Um, but it, hopefully it's, it, 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 it gets you to think about how we ought to read the Bible, how we ought to interpret Scripture. So God bless you guys. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Do not forget to subscribe to the channel.